Hey and welcome to this tutorial on how to use DMA frequency data in material model calibrations using M calibration. Um, DMA data is something that's very commonly received and, and obtained when you characterize different polymers experimentally. It gives you a lot of information about the dynamic response at small strengths and therefore useful for material model calibration. But I, I receive a lot of questions about how you can really use frequency data in the calibration procedure. What does it mean and how does that really work? So what I'm going to try to do in this uh, tutorial is to describe a little bit about the theory behind it and how you can use this type of data in M calibration. So let's start by simply talking about the theory a little bit. Um, I'm going to go through that very quickly here. If you want to read more about it and learn a little bit more, you should, should take a look at my book, Mechanics of Solid Polymers, that has a whole section uh, devoted to this topic. Uh, but for now, let's talk about a dynamic uh, load case where you have a specimen that you load with a mean strain that's constant and a constant strain amplitude and a frequency of the applied uh, strain omega. So the, the general equation for the strain history is the one up here. So we take your specimen, we pull it, for example, to the mean strain, we sinusoidally load it around that point with a given frequency. So if you want to analyze DMA data uh, of frequency type, you really need to know the mean strain, the strain amplitude, and the frequency, of course. Uh, perhaps also the temperature, if that's something that's been varied in the test. Uh, what the machine will then measure uh, is the stress response. So a stress is a function of time, which will be a mean stress, a stress amplitude, and a sinusoidally varying stress with a frequency that's equal to the applied strain, but maybe a phase angle. So the stress is typically out of phase with the strain due to the viscous nature of the material. But we can see one assumption really here uh, right away, that there are, of course, materials where the stress response is not sinusoidal when the strain response is sinusoidal. This would be uh, nonlinear viscoelastic or, vi or viscoplastic materials where the output response may be different. And in those cases, a dynamic test where you get storage and loss modules may be of lesser value unless you know exactly how the software that was used to, to extract the storage and loss modules worked. And for nonlinear viscoplastic materials, it's typically better to work in the time domain than instead of a storage and loss modulus. But assume that you have now the stress response. Um, well, what you typically require for the DMA analysis is the storage and the loss modulus. So storage modulus is typically called E prime or G prime. Loss modulus is E double prime uh, or G double prime. Um, and uh, you can, uh, through mathematical uh, manipulations, quickly come up with this equation where the stress as a function of time has the same mean stress as this one. But you basically expand the sine function into a part that's in phase with the stress and the part that's out of phase. And these moduli values here is what you're looking for uh, in your analysis. Uh, most DMA test systems does this automatically for you. If you're curious what they're doing, uh, you can read about it in the book, as I mentioned. Here is one way to extract it, uh, where you see that the storage modulus can be calculated from the stress history that you measure, and you multiply that with the sine omega t divided by the strain amplitude, and you take the integral as indicated here, and that gives you a storage modulus for the material and the loss modulus for that material at the given uh, frequency. There are other ways to do it too, uh, with Fourier transforms, etc., uh, but that's not something I will go through here. Uh, once you have the storage and the loss modulus, you can then use it in your calibration procedure. Um, there are a few notes that are important to, to keep in mind that um, this storage and loss modulus is not necessarily only useful for uniaxial data. You can do it in shear, shear loading. You can use it in biaxial loading. You can use it in plane strain loading. Any loading mode you can think of, if you have a machine that can test it, uh, then you can get storage and loss modulus in that loading mode. Uh, but it does assume that the stress response is for, uh, has the same shape as the strain response that you drive it with. Um, and that is a limitation uh, for, uh, for, for certain materials. And note 
that you, there is no way to determine the storage in the loss modulus if all you have is monotonic data. You really need some cyclic data or stress relaxation or creep data uh, in order to get that behavior. Uh, so now let's assume that we have some experimental data uh, that we want to analyze. So I, here in my case, I have a data file that I want to work with. I open this file with a text editor. We see that there are a number of columns of data here with a mean strain. We have a strain amplitude. And then we have a frequency in radians per second. We have a storage modulus and the loss modulus. So there are five columns here. Uh, the first three are, as we discussed a few minutes ago, the input to the test. And the last two are the measured quantities, the storage and the loss modulus. Um, so how would we use this? Well, I'm going to open M calibration. And I'm going to go to calibrate. I'm going to open a new uh, test case, load case, by clicking on the plus sign here. I'm going to now switch from the type uh, of data that we have from experimental data to dynamic data, E prime and E double prime. So I select this one. And then we'll see a lot of features here that we'll talk about in a minute. The first thing we do is to load in our experimental data file by clicking on load experimental file. I then select this uh, CSV file with the five columns that we just talked about. So I open this. And in this dialog box, we'll see that there's seven rows of data. And we have to specify now to the software which of these columns contain the, what data. So in our case, the mean strain was in column one. The strain amplitude was in column two. The frequency column was three. But it was in radians per second, not hertz. So I switched that one. Storage modulus, loss modulus. So that's the input that we have. So we can say OK. And the, here's just the, a plot of the, in this case, frequency versus storage modulus. We can plot it later in, in, in the main window. But there are some other features here that are worth talking about. Uh, sometimes you have uh, data at different temperatures. So you can specify a temperature here. We don't need to worry about that here. All our data is at a temperature, which happened to be room temperature. There's a feature here that says number of cycles. This is an important feature, um, and I will talk about that when I demonstrate how this works. Um, so the way it works, um, I guess we can mention it in the DMA machine. And when you run a DMA test, uh, the test system will cycle uh, uh, the strain with a given frequency and strain amplitude. But it extracts the dynamic data uh, gradually as it changes the strain uh, frequency or amplitude. In M calibration, um, what we do, uh, we specify the number of cycles that will be applied before it takes the last cycle and extracts the dynamic properties, the storage and the loss modulus from it. And there, it's not using the first cycle uh, because it takes a while sometimes to reach steady state. So you want to have a steady state viscous response. And that's where you can specify here how many cycles should be applied before it tries to extract the storage and the loss modulus. This uh, box here is how many data points uh, should it take per cycle. And then these two uh, boxes specify how important is the storage and the LOX modulus values if you want to calibrate a material model to the data by saying them to be, both of them to be 0 0.5. That means that uh, they're both equally important uh, for the calibration. So we can, we can keep the default here for now. I'm then going to go to loading mode this is important because here you have to specify what type of dma test was done was it the uniaxial test intention that is was it the shear test biaxial test or whatnot um, so you have to specify that obviously and here i just can assume it was a uniaxial test so i say okay and now i've read in my data here but if you look at the graph we see no data there's nothing here so we need to change the graph the plot in order to see the dynamic data. So I'm going to click on the x-axis to switch the, the type of data that's plotted. I'm going to go down to dynamic data and open up the sub uh, menu here and say on the x-axis, I want to plot frequency in hertz. On the y-axis, I want to plot dynamic data uh, storage modulus. And I say OK. Now we can see the experimental data here. Um, since we had just a few data points, I'm going to change the, the graph a little bit. I double click on this one. I'm going to go to plot styles. I'm going to add an experimental marker. And the predictions, I'm going to switch them to be a different color just so we can see them better. 
and we'll do a, a different marker. All right, so there we go. Here's our uh, data, and um, that's kind of interesting. What I want to do is we want to plot all the data. There is a feature here that can allow us to plot two graphs side by side. So now on the left side, we have storage modules versus frequency. If I click on the right side to select it, I can change the, the quantities that are plotted here. I'm going to plot on the x-axis frequency in hertz, y-axis loss modulus. Um, so here's the loss modulus data, and on the left is the stor storage modulus data. So that looks pretty good. Um, now, let's see how we work with this data. So let me take a look at that. Um, well, we need to select the material model. I'm not going to focus too much on the actual calibration, but just to demonstrate a few features, I'm going to select the material model. I'll go, I'm going to pick a abacus linear viscoelastic material model. I want to use a yo hyperelasticity, and I want to use, I just want to use four prony series terms. You can pick whatever you want, but it doesn't matter for example here. So here's our material model parameters. Um, in this case, um, the data goes to very small strains. So there is no need to calibrate the nonlinear terms in the Yo hyperelastic model, so I make those zero. Um, and then we have the volumetric. This is a prony series with uh, shear relaxation and volumetric relaxation. For simplicity, in our example, I'm going to deactivate the volumetric relaxation. I'm going to make the k term zero. And there's only now um, shear relaxation terms. Then we look at the frequency, the, the characteristic time values are reasonable. It goes from 10 to the minus 4 to 10 to the minus 1. And that's sort of in line with the frequencies that we're interested in. So that sounds pretty good. Uh, I will now click run once. If I click run once, you will see in this window down here that M calibration um, prints one line for each data point in your DMA file. So if I go back to this, I right click on this and I say edit experimental data. This one, uh, we can bring over the data, we can look at it. We have these seven uh, rows of data and there's basically one data point for each row. One, one row specifies the mean strain, amplitude, the frequency, and then the, the, re the reported values. And that's why M calibration does the same thing. So it considers each of those rows a separate test, and it calculates, runs that test, and calculates the storage and the loss modulus from that data. That's that's kind of the procedure it does. Um, we can, uh, before we try to optimize the parameters, it's good to plot some other things here to kind of explain this a little bit more. So in my figure to the right here, I'm going to plot. Uh, engineering stress, engineering strain, if, uh, in this case. So I was going to click on this E button here. And what we see is that it plots the predicted uh, stress-strain curve for the last cycle uh, uh, of the last, uh, for the last of these rows. There's seven rows of data here. And it takes the last one and plots this here. And so what we see is that with these parameters that we have right now, it's the, each cycle, it's the stress keeps going down due to viscous relaxation. So we don't actually have an equilibrium state yet. So I'm going to change that. So I'm going to double click on the low case. I'm going to say instead of four cycles to equilibrium, I'm going to take it to be 10. And I'm going to run this again. And uh, now it's, it's taking and analyzing all of those seven uh, rows. And um, it should plot for us the prediction of the storage and the loss modulus of the last row once it's done with this. It shouldn't change the predictions too much, but it, it should allow us to see if we reach more of a steady state. So we can see that now on the figure to right. It's more or less a steady state response to the right here in the last cycle. So that's what you want to do. You want to make sure that you have enough cycles to reach the steady state in your material. We can see now that the predicted storage modulus is way too low. Um, we can change that. Clearly, the, the C10 term needs to be much higher. Uh, that's uh, giving this point here. Then it should be, instead of a 2, it should be almost 20. So this should be almost 10 times higher. 
Uh, and then we have to search for these shear relaxation terms. Um, but that's really uh, outside the, the scope of this little tutorial. All I wanted to show you is how you can import this here and how you set up the calibration. I will have another video later on where I talk about which material model works well for this kind of data and uh, things like that. Um, finally, the, the last comment I have is that the, the beauty of M calibration, really the value that comes in here is that you can combine this data set with many other experiments. So in, in my example here, I happen to have a tension test and both a fast and a slow, I can add this to my calibration. So I just click on plus, I have experimental data, load file, I'm gonna say fast and I add it. And I just read it in, stress drain as usual. Here is another test that was performed. And uh, you see that I'm going to change the color of this one so we can see it. It's experimental green. And here. So now we see we have the DMA data on the left, storage modulus that is. On the right, we have the new experimental data. And if I want to run this one, we'll see it's not going to fit at all. But I can select this load case and I click run. It will just run that particular load case for us. And this is the prediction down here. So clearly this needs to be much stiffer, um, but that's the, that's, the, that's the value here. In M calibration, you can combine both DMA data, retention data, whatever data you have, and it can calibrate uh, at all, to all data at once. Um, all right, that's it. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, stop here. Thank you.